First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for, giving, for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to give this talk. And generally, I would say it's a big privilege to be a participant of this super interesting interdisciplinary meeting here. Uh, <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm used to make forecasts. And I also like to make a forecast about the future of uh, two important or the two most important vector ticks in Central Europe. But I'm used to make forecast about some days. And this is a forecast about several years. It's much more difficult and much more vague. Um, well, let's see how it goes. Well, ticks are worldwide distributed. And as blood feeding parasites on terrestrial vertebrates, uh, they are specially qualified uh, to be vectors of disease. They are, they cause high economic loss in livestock farming and also serious health problems in humans and pets. So they are of major interest, like mosquitoes, for example. Well, we are here in North America, so it's perhaps quite good to start with a slide where you find some familiar things. Most of you will be familiar with the main vector of Lyme disease in the eastern uh, United States, Ixodus scapularis, and perhaps also with Ixodus pacificus, uh, an important bridge vector of Lyme borrelia in the west. Uh, these two tick species are part of the subgenus Ixodus, and this subgenus hosts the most important vector ticks within the genus Ixodus uh, in the northern temperate zone of the world. There's also the so-called tiger tick, Ixodus pelsicatus, and the area where I'm from, uh, from Europe, it's Ixodus resinus, uh, which is important. And this, I, I, I got this slide from Jeremy Gray, and when I saw this, I was really surprised how large the distribution area of Ixodus resinus is. Uh, for example, in comparison with Ixodus scapularis. And this also shows Ixodus resinus is present in different climate zones in uh, Europe, but we don't know much about this tick. Although it is by far the best investigated tick in Europe, but whenever you ask basic questions about the ecology and also about the future of that species in the next decades or even centuries, uh, you will find gaps, basic gaps in our knowledge. So I try my best to collect the existing knowledge about, especially here about the life cycle, and uh, well, but there will be some question marks that is clear at the end. So, Ixodus resinus is in Central Europe widely distributed and common, and uh, approximately eight to 10 million tick bites of this tick occur per year in Germany. And we have 82, approximately 82 million people. So it's quite a common problem in Germany to get a tick bite. Uh, this tick transmits Borrelia burgdorferi, uh, causing Lyme disease, Lyme borreliosis. And we have every year approximately 50,000 to 100,000 new cases. That's a lot more than in the United States. So we have a health problem in this respect. The problem in Europe is, um, is a bit different f in, in one respect, at least from the United States, because we have different geno so-called genospecies of Borrelia burgdorferi, and some of them may be human pathogenic, others not. So the picture at the medical side, I know it's also complicated here, but it's also very complicated in Europe. And we have another very important disease, tick-borne encephalitis, caused by a virus. Uh, in Germany, we have 200 to 500 cases per year. Uh, this does not sound very much, but if you get the neurological part of the disease, it's a real severe disease. There's no treatment, and, uh, but you can get vaccination, uh, but it's a severe disease, yeah. There are other uh, tick-borne pathogens transmitted by the ticks, but I will not go into any detail with this. Um, now, the, sec the second important vector tick in Central Europe is Dermacenta reticulatus. 
You also have dermacenter ticks here, dermacenter, dermacenter andersoniae, the wood tick, and dermacenter variabilis, the American dog tick. Uh, but uh, the life cycle, the biology is a bit different in Eurasian dermacenter species. Um, well, it is more and more widely distributed and common. That's interesting also when we try to look into the future of this tick. Uh, but on, very rarely, at least in Central Europe, people are bitten by this tick. Um, the major issue is that it can transmit a protozoan, Babesia canis canis. This, cause, uh, this uh, bug caused canine babesiosis, and this is a very dangerous disease for dogs, especially if you do not know what the reason is. Um, well, this is a rough life cycle of uh, hard ticks of the family Ixodidae. Uh, you generally have four development, four life stages. Um, you have three parasitic life stages. Each of them needs a blood meal. And, uh, well, that's the main point. We come back to this a bit later. Um, I will try to uh, discuss the possible or probable future of these tick species coming from the life cycle. And uh, I'm interested in phases which are quite flexible. Flexible means if conditions change, they can happen di in a different season, quicker, whatever. And I'm looking for inflexible phases, the breaks in the life cycle of these ticks, because it's very easy to say when it's warmer, tick development will be quicker and quicker, and, uh, but this is very layperson-like, lay and as biologists, we have another look onto this, I think. So the main questions are, how do Exodus resinus and Dermacenter reticulatus organize their life cycle? What are their regulative phases in their life? How strong or how flexible is their regulative power? What do we know about their current distribution and abundance? How will they perform in a warmer world? And how will their distribution and abundance be affected by higher temperatures? Um, let's start with Dermacenter. Uh, this map from Germany shows you the current distribution very roughly. And uh, here you have the presumed current northern limit of distribution of Dermacenter reticulatus. And uh, 20 years ago or 22 years ago, when we tried to collect this tick, we drove to Saxonia. And, uh, and now the tick is in Berlin. Unbelievable. And it's also north of Berlin, but not much north. And uh, so this tick is just moving to the north. So we'll see how it may develop over the next years. Well, distribution, Ixodus resinus, I would say is boring, because in every county you will find Ixodus resinus in Germany. Distribution resinus. Uh, there may be some mountains. Ixodus resinus is, does not occur in, at higher mountains. That may be a, a, a task for the future for Ixodus resinus. And there are very good studies from the Czech Republic showing that Ixodus resinus during the last 20, 25 years was able to climb some mountains, to be there, and also to harbor some pathogens there. Um, well, what, the, what are common habitats of Ixodus resinus in Central Europe? It's mixed forest um, with, for example, with beech trees and oaks and its edges. And beech trees and oaks are very important uh, factors for this tick because the leaves, the fallen leaves of these trees will need for being decomposed five to seven years. That's much longer than other deciduous trees. So where you have these trees, you will have a leaf litter, which has different uh, generations of fallen leaf. And Ixodus resinus likes high relative humidity. And such a, a big, a large, or, or deep uh, layer of old leaves is like a refugium. And it's easy for the tick to find just the right relative humidity to survive there. 
uh, it's follow land. Uh, this during the last, during the past 20 years, this was quite common because the European Union, they sponsored uh, that farmers uh, stopped working on some parts of the land to do some agricultural uh, work there, and they were paid for neglecting these areas. And these areas were super for ticks, I can tell you. Um, meadows are only good for this tick if the conditions are humid enough. In areas where you have regular rainfall, or within forest, meadows within forest. And also places where you have a lot of human traffic, parks, camping grounds, cemeteries, uh, you can find exodus resinous. But only in Berlin, I can tell you, there's the inner city park, the Tiergarten, and there were no ticks in the late 70s. And then they changed the management that they let the old leaves in the bushes in the, in the fall. They didn't clear them. And 10 years later, they had a tick problem. There was no change in the host community. It was the only change they did, and that was a switch for Exodus Resinus to exist there. Well, also gardens. Gardens are very bad from, from an epidemiological point of view, because when you have ticks in your garden infected with Borrelia, it's very difficult to protect yourself or your children or whatever. So a lot of cases of Lyme Borreliosis occur in gardens. You will not find exodus resinous in, on dry meadows and agricultural fields. So some photos, this is a typical mixed forest, also with some coniferous trees uh, here also. And you see the closed and permanent leaf litter. This is a coniferous forest. It's, if there is not regularly rainfall, it's not so popular for exodus resinous. But also there, you, you will find some exodus resinous. Well, some, some figures about the life cycle. Uh, one year ago or two years ago, we would have said the life cycle is two to four years, uh, on average three years. But we found that the life cycle under natural conditions is much longer. And, but I cannot go into any details with this. But the longevity of a vector tick, you can easily imagine, is very important if you make some eco-epidemiological analysis. You must know how long-lived is a tick, how long can certain pathogens survive in the vector tick. Well, uh, here again, the three parasitic uh, life stages. And if you add up the, the parasitic phases, you come up with two or three weeks. But the whole life cycle needs four to six years, that means 99% of the life cycle, the tick will spend free living. So, and there, it is, uh, it is uh, amongst various abiotic conditions. So to understand the life cycle, to understand the preferences and tolerances of this tick, uh, we need to look at the free living stages. Uh, what are critical environmental factors for the occurrence of Ixodus resinus? Well, it's the habitat, veg vegetation, and the vegetation, to a large part, they steer the microclimate, especially the humidity. Uh, so tick survival is touched from this, especially the off-host tick uh, biology and especially water balance of the tick. Um, a very important factor is rainfall. When it rains, then the leaf litter will keep some water for several days. And that's, as you know, the place where resting exodus resinous occur. So it's not only relative humidity as a weather factor. It's, I would say it's much more rainfall. And the permanent leaf litter I already mentioned. In general, it's important for this tick, as for many arthropods, terrestrial arthropods, the length of the growing season. But in Central Europe, it's in the centrum of the distribution of this tick. This is not a limiting factor. Uh, only in mountains, that will be a factor. And the lower threshold is 8 to 10% of, of the development. This is not very special. What about winter temperatures? That's a third of the year is winter, more or less. And winter biology very often is a neglected point in the biology of organisms. Um, well, and uh, 
my partner at Tikrada, Hans Dautel, he worked many years on uh, cold hardiness and the winter biology of Ixodes racinus and other tick species. Everything what is deeper than minus 10 degrees Celsius, the longer it endures, the more dangerous is it for the tick. Um, it is clear that ticks need hosts in general, I would say, but this is not the bottleneck of uh, the life cycle, within the life cycle of Ixodes racinus. There's one exception, that's the host, the host for adult ticks. And the adult tick is not a Catholic feeder like the larvae and nymphs, but it is exclusively found on medium-sized and large mammals. And that, in some places, uh, is uh, limiting the abundance of Ixodes racinus. Um, common reticulatus habitats. Um, Ixodes racinus is a wood tick, in principle, Dermacenter reticulatus is not. It likes open landscape, mixed, mosaic-like mixed landscapes, light forest with clearings, also the external edges of forest, grassland with bushes, follow land, meadows, moorland. And uh, this is a picture I couldn't have taken 25 years ago because there was a Berlin Wall around West Berlin. I, I come from former West Berlin and I had one wonderful habitat with a lot of Ixodes racinus. Unfortunately, I lost it with the fall of the wall, but well, nevertheless, I'm a fan of the fall of the wall. And uh, this area now is free for, for hikers, for walkers, whatever, joggers. Um, and uh, here you see a lot of grasses close to the forest. And in this uh, border strip, you will find masses of Dermacenter reticulatus. So also that at least this tick species benefits from uh, the development around former West Berlin. What are the critical factors for Dermacenta? It's the length of the growing season, especially the microclimatic summer temperatures. You will understand it better when I come back in some minutes to this. Uh, sun, oh, sun exposure is a, a very important factor. It's not a wood tick, as I said, but it loves exposed stands, uh, meadows, there comes more sun, and so development is speeded up, and this is quite important. Availability of suitable host, it's a bit similar as with Ixodes racinus, but here exclusively large mammals, wild boar, roe deer, red deer, are the typical hosts of Dermacenter reticulatus adult ticks. Winter temperatures, in this case, does not seem very important. Uh, it seems that the whole Dermacenter in Eurasia more or less comes from the east, from mid-Asia. Uh, there are several species, for example, in, the Mong in, Mo in Mongolia. And uh, when you live in Mongolia as a tick, you must be very cold resistant. Uh, because in such an area, uh, day by day, you have enormous temperature uh, oscillations and during the night sometimes there is minus 20 and over the day it's plus 10 or 12 and then these ticks Dermacenta nutali, not reticulatus, is active then. So winter is not a big issue. Um, well, it's perhaps not easy to understand that it is interesting to know about the life cycle and the seasonality of different events within the life cycle uh, in order to get a better understanding of the vector role of a certain tick. And uh, well, but the seasonal timing of the life cycle of a given tick species in a certain region has critical consequences for its suitability as a vector of pathogens and for the perpetuation of any microbial agents vectored by that tick species. And I would like to show this to you in the next slides. Um, this is a slide showing Ixodes racinus and Dermacenter reticulatus. Uh, the, when do these guys feed in different life stages? The egg is not a feeding stage, but okay, it's there. If we start with Ixodes racinus, it's a very simple story. Uh, the larva feeds from May to October. You will find active and feeding larvae on hosts, and it's not much different with the nymphs and adults. They start a bit earlier, and they may be a bit longer active in the fall, but nevertheless, it's the same. And what appears here 
they are active for a long time of the year at the same time. They will meet on the host. And this is very important for any kind of transmission of tick-borne pathogens. Different life stages must meet, that you can establish a circle of transmission. Well, when we look uh, at reticulatus, it's completely different. And here, let me uh, start with the egg, although it's not a feeding stage. It is only there in early spring. So the, the female, whether it feeds in more in the fall or in the late winter or spring, it lays its eggs in, in spring, in early spring. And the resultant larvae are, you will find only in May and June, but you will not find them because they are in the nests of animals. And they are not long-lived in contrast to Exodus recensus. They live without blood meal six weeks at 15 degrees Celsius, then they die. But when you are in a nest, you have a good chance to find a host very quickly. They rapidly develop to the next stage whenever they get a blood meal. The nymphs are on the host on July and August. Also, they are looking for a host within nests. Well, and they give rise in the same growing season to adults. So this se sequence of events must, be, must happen that Dermacenta reticulatus can exist. And now it's easier to understand the warmer it is, uh, the easier it is to, to, uh, to, to make all these steps within one growing season. And when the climate gets warmer, it's clear that this tick can more and more go to the north because the conditions are favorable. But there's also uh, these, the lava and the nymph, they only meet in rare cases on hosts. And uh, we know from Ixodes scapularis here in the northeast, it's great. First you have the nymph, then the larvae. So the nymphs infect the hosts, and the hosts then uh, infect the larval stage. In textbooks, it's very nice. Uh, here, it's just the other way around. Uh, the larvae says goodbye when the nymph arrives. So that's bad situation. Forget a, a transmission cycle of any tick-borne pathogens. And if you and the adults are on completely different hosts than the larval and the nymphal stage, and they feed more or less on other times of the year, so the adults does not meet feeding larvae and nymphs, nor in space nor in time, neither neither in time. Okay, here the primary way again, very briefly, of Exodus recensus born infections: Borrelia burgdorferi, TBE virus. Usually, a feeding nymph or some feeding nymphs are infected. They infect the host. They, the host, if it's a reservoir host or a co-feeding host, it passes on the infection to feeding larvae. These larvae develop to nymphs. And again, if they are infected, these, this is a very, I would say, simple circulation. With dermacenter, it's more complicated or more uh, not, so, not so easy to perform. Here it is that if you have an infect only, and in this case, it's Babesia canis, is a tick-borne pathogen, which I, I, I take as an example. Infected adults uh, um, infect the host, and in turn, other feeding adults are infected. And the adult stage can live two years or even longer. So you can have different generations of adult ticks at the same time. So, and these feeding adults, they trans ovarily transmit their infection to their offspring, and uh, then not the larvae, not the nymph, only the next adult of the F1 generation will again infect the host. So, trans ovarial transmission is essential if dermacenter is a maintenance vector of a given pathogen. So, Dermacenter is not a maintenance vector of TBE virus. Here, transovarial transmission is very rare. As I said, feeding adults do not meet feeding immatures, and nymphs seasonally follow the larvae. So that doesn't work. Well, um, I also saw in, in one other talk, conclusion and question, quite nice, but they are close together. 
uh, life cycles of dermocenter reticulatus and ixodus resinus have different, very different seasonalities, which has significant consequences for their differential roles as vectors. And now the next question is, what are the regulating intrinsic and extrinsic factors for each species? And uh, will the duration of the life cycle be different with increasing temperatures? Um, first, I would like to clear two different forms of dormancy. Dormancy says it's a break. It's a break in the development or in the activity. And there are two distinctly different uh, things or, or, or patterns of dormancy. One is so-called quiescence. This is a direct direction to unfavorable external conditions. For example, it's getting cold, and the, the ticks in this case would react and go down from the grass stems and wait until uh, the external conditions become favorable again. It's a direct reaction. Diapause is genetically fixed dormancy induced before the beginning of unfavorable conditions. For example, when these ticks, Ixodus resinus, enter diapause, they do so as early as in August because of the winter, but very early, and this is genetically fixed and induced by photoperiod. Uh, this is not the ultimate factor, the factor which makes it necessary for the tick to rest, uh, but it's only the Zeitgeber to give the right timing. And the reason for entering diapause, maybe the winter, maybe drought, whatever. Uh, what about it, Dermacenta reticulatus? There's also some form of diapause in Dermacenta reticulatus. You will not find the adults questing in the summer. And as I already mentioned, engorged females do not oviposit when they are freshly fed in the fall, although the, with the temperature it would be okay, but they don't. Even if you keep them in the laboratory at 20 degrees Celsius, they don't lay any eggs. And this starts only in the next spring. This is also a process called uh, seasonal gating. And seasonal gating is a very important regulative process to coordinate the whole life cycle with different seasons. Well, quiescence uh, is these dermocenter adults are, can be active in January, can be in December, but they are not if it's very cold, if you have snow cover, whatever. And this is a form of quiescence because whenever it's mild again, these ticks come out. So dermocenter has a regulatory role only in the adult stage. Um, but this seasonal pattern will be most probably also very stable in a warmer environment because uh, you cannot break diapause even with 20 degrees uh, in the winter. Uh, and this, the climate may be much warmer in several decades, but uh, this will not change. Well, sorry for this seemingly very complicated thing, I would say it's, the message is not so complicated. Uh, here we are in Ixodus resinus. There are forms or periods of dormancy. On the left-hand side, you have the different life stages. And when you take a given life stage, uh, there are different developmental phases within one life stage. And some of the life stages are able to enter diapause. So, and this I would call the breaks in the life cycle. Whenever temperatures will be higher, these breaks will be, as far as I think, will be effective to prevent that the life cycle will get shorter and shorter. Uh, and there's some evidence from the lab biology or lab experiments with Ixodus resinus. You can imagine there are many, in many labs, uh, there are transmission experiments. And so you infect a given laboratory host by feeding nymphs, then you put on it negative uh, or na yeah, naive uh, xenodiagnostic larvae, and then you're waiting that these xenodiagnostic larvae will develop to the next stage and are hungry again for the next blood meal. But this is a time where you sit and cannot do anything. And the funding agency says, what about your results? What about your publications? And you said, well, my tick is not really hungry. It needs some time. Please, for your understanding, 
that's a real problem when you have funding and working with this. So even, and most of these things, I can tell you with recentness, failed, failed completely. They had a, a feeding success and of 15 or 20 percent. They waited only for five or six months after the larval blood meal, and this is not Ixodus ricinus. Ixodus ricinus is a very slow guy. And so I'm really convinced that uh, the, life, the duration of the life cycle and the seasonality of Ixodus ricinus will not change, even if temperatures are two degrees higher uh, than now. Well, this is not very important. This only shows you when you feed ticks in the spring or early summer, no diapause, 100% direct development to the uh, next developmental stage. And then in midsummer, there's a switch. And then these engorged nymphs, you have 100% diapause, no direct development. These guys will overwinter in the engorged state and only will molt only in the next summer. That's quite a long time. Okay. Um, yes, here's some expectations concerning Xorus recentness. What will happen if it's warmer? And uh, I rely on the climate change prediction for Eastern Germany. Um, it's from region to region. The predictions are really a bit different. So I take this region, yeah. And the prediction is that the warmers will be warmer and drier and that there will be more precipitation in winter than now. This is quite consistent uh, with the map that was shown a bit earlier today. Well, the winter, in the winter, if the winter is molder, you will find more often occasional questing Ixodus ricinus. And we found uh, in, the, in the winter of 2006 to 7, we found regularly, it, the winter in Berlin was like in Marseille. So the winter in Berlin was 4.6 degrees Celsius on an average warmer than a normal winter in Berlin. And Ixodus recentus nymphs and adults were permanently active. In January, we collected in two man hours more than 100 Ixodus recentus. This sometimes is not so easy in May. It was amazing. We never experienced something like this. So this can happen. Then if it's warmer or milder in the spring, the questing period may begin earlier. In summer, it may be a bit difficult because, because of phases of heat and drought. We'll see what happened there. And in the fall, if it's warmer, a later end of the questing period. We very often see this. Uh, well, but a tick takes a blood meal. A blood meal has a certain amount of energy and substance. And a tick cannot be active forever and ever. Although Exodus recentness, we have some cases from the engorged nymph, freshly engorged nymph away from the host until the final questing that may need three years, or, or not need is not the right word, that way may endure three years that the tick without getting another blood meal can be questing and is still full, active, and so on. Um, but a tick cannot always be busy. We cannot always be busy. A tick can also not be busy. And if a tick is busy in the winter, it may be that the energy is not enough to be active still in the fall. This is open. We will see what a tick can perform. And this changes from year to year, I can tell you. Even at the same location, uh, the, the, the pattern of the seasonal activity changes very much from year to year. So weather has a clear effect. And this is a question mark. So uh, for the time being, I don't think that the duration of the life cycle will be much shorter in Exodus recentness than so far. Um, there are different sorts of forest in Central Europe where you can find Exodus recentness. This I already say, so I can, I think, uh, only one more point that beech trees and oak, oaks, which are very favorable for Exodus recentness, are also favorable for tick host populations because they produce interesting things you can eat as a mouse as a squirrel, whatever. So there's also another positive indirect infect, uh, effect on the tick populations. So, but the present forest, the mixed forest, they will not stay the same in Central Europe. And that's a very interesting paper, series of papers by this Curling et al. Um, we have, for, 
approximately 40, 35 to 40 percent in Germany of the whole forest is made by spruce and pine trees. And they are at their limit. They are northern species, and because of the glacier period, they came to the south. And they are still there because it's okay for them. But when we, when we, expect, oh, when we expect a temperature increase of two degrees Celsius, they will no longer be productive, and they will suffer, and they will decline. However, oaks and beech trees will increase. They will take this. And when we are talking ecology, this will be a process of hundreds or even thousands of years. But most of the forest in Germany is economic forest, economically used forest. So the, the character of the forest is up to the forest owner. He will decide, what will I plant in this kind of forest? And he knows this. And when he knows that spruce and pine trees will not give much wood, then he thinks, what are the alternatives? And the alternatives there are oaks and beech trees. So this change will be very rapid. It will fall, follow eco e uh, economic laws and not ecological laws. Well, and this is clear that from this dramatic change over the next decades, Exodus Reasoners will increase and uh, also uh, the abundance uh, and Exodus Reasoners born disease will benefit, will increase from this. Uh, and there's also a point already now is we have a lot of spruce forest, pure, pure uh, spruce forest, and for ecological reason, uh, people are changing this into mixed forest. Also, this is a very good signal uh, for Exodus Reasoners without that climate change. So, so that change will dramatically increase. So what does it mean for, the for all this, for the future distribution of Damascenta reticulatus in Germany? Well, this is, again, the current presumed northern distribution limit you can be quite sure that Dermacenter reticulatus will go closer to the Baltic Sea and the North Sea. It will increase its distribution area. Uh, again, with Exodus Reasoners, it's not a topic distribution. It's everywhere, but it will climb a little bit higher in the mountains. And at the end of my talk, I will. Uh, the year 2012 was a very special year for Exodus Reasoners and for Exodus Reasoners researchers. Uh, why? It was a very low Exodus Reasoners abundance in several areas in Germany. I could say many areas, but I'm better a bit cautious. This was based on counting of questing tick uh, on field plots, what we did, and flagging of questing ticks, we did, and also some other researchers in Germany did so. And there was also a very low incidence of tick-borne encephalitis. I would call this hard data because the, the system, it's a notifiable disease and the system is very reliable. Also a low incidence of human lambroiosis, this I would call soft data because it's only in parts of Germany a notifiable disease. And well, also notified cases, cases it's not so sure, it's not so clear as with tick-borne encephalitis. Well, some, briefly some data to give you the real information. Uh, I selected, we have six different tick locations where we permanently work over the whole year. And I selected Bielefeld and Gießen. And uh, the dotted uh, curves are those from 2011. And the normal curves are from 2012. The red ones are adult exodus resonance. The blue ones are NIMS. All this were... Um, uh, observations on our field plots, there is no time to go into more detail with the methodology. If you ask me, it's my pleasure to answer this. Um, and you can, I think, clearly see how much lower over the whole year, 2012, the seasonal activity uh, was uh, in comparison to 2011. And uh, when you take the weather data, from these two places, it, yes, we, we were speculating. What was it? And we didn't find anything which was really spectacular. There was only one thing 
We had a very cold and extreme cold spell in Germany in January, February 2012. And uh, here, this uh, line will show you the maximum temperature. So the temperature did not uh, go over zero degrees Celsius for more than two weeks. The dotted line is the minimum temperature five centimeter above the ground where exothermic more or less is. And you can see it goes up to minus 15 or in some cases up down to minus 20 degrees Celsius, which is clearly bad news for exothermic Well, exothermic occurs in Scandinavia. Well, what's the problem with these temperatures? Well, in Scandinavia, normally, you have a snow cover, a big snow cover during the winter. And what about the snow cover here? You can see here the scale, approximately less than one centimeter. And for a long time, nothing. And here, the same. And snow has a clearly buffering effect. If you measure in the winter, in the winter night especially, temperature just above the snow cover and below the snow cover, you will end up with much lower temperatures above the snow cover. And at the moment, this is our working hypothesis that this was responsible for this. This unusual cold spell in the winter in combination with a missing or very thin snow cover in many areas had, as far as we think at the moment, strong effect on the survival of ticks, also on the physical, of their physiological condition, and therefore also on the overall level of questing in the subsequent vegetation period. We have ticks um, on our, in our field plots, which were put out as engorged nymphs in the fall of 2011. And these ticks will be active in 2013. And so I, I'm a bit optimistic to say we might obtain some more conclusive data on this in 2013, because it's, uh, all the ticks mold in the summer those ticks from the autumn 2011, they experienced the cold, whereas the ticks which were put out in early summer 2012, they didn't experience the cold. So I would expect, if we are right with our hypothesis, that those ticks put out in early summer 2012, they do very well, they are very active, if nothing bad happens this winter, but the ticks uh, which were put out in the, the fall 2011, they will have a very bad performance. Well, this here are the, the figures of the TBE cases. You have the last three, the past three years, you have the average of 10 years, and here have the poor results from 2012. And also Lyme borreliosis cases, 60% of the, the cases in 2011. Uh, that also shows if you, it's not a proof, it's also human behavior, we all know this. But it's a strong indication that when you're working on vectors and on vector ecology, and you find really clear trends, that this might also be um, very indicative of what's going on with the tick-borne diseases. Okay, final consideration. A warmer climate in Central Europe might increase the abundance of exodus resonance. This is an indirect, indirect effect of the vegetation. It might extend the distribution area of Dermacenta reticulatus at its northern border. And it might not strongly affect the seasonal timing and the length of the life cycles of exodus resonance nor Dermacenta reticulatus. And one point which is hard to define, uh, when we are talking about vector ecology, we should also, and, and climate and weather, we should also have a look at the occurrence of extreme weather spells in the future uh, in our consideration, because they will, from time to time, will have a strong, strong impact on the well-being of these uh, vector tick populations. And all this sounds very concrete. I'm well aware that there are major gaps in our knowledge, uh, and uh, so it's clear that much more research is needed very often on very basic questions, and I only talked about Central Europe. In England, there was Sarah Randolph. She has also built very nice models. But in other parts of Europe, we don't know anything about the life cycle, and this is, I think, demanding to do. So 
there, were, there are many people in the field which do the work. I, I do not present many of the results. Uh, we are grateful for the support from the German Ministry of the Environment for collecting data and yes, thank you very much for your kind attention. <laughs>